Good morning or good afternoon, everyone. Um, I'm Cassiana Montaigne. Uh, I'm an associated professor from the Institute of Chemistry at the University of Campinas in Brazil. And it's my pleasure to be the moderator of this third session of Team One about emergent pollutants in aquatic ecosystem with the co-moderated left column that is here with me. And um, just to remind all of our speakers that this session is being recorded, uh, we invited you all to submit your questions in English via KAM uh, button. You can find this button, as may you know, uh, in the bottom of uh, your screen. Um, um, let's see. Another uh, comment before I started. Uh, as you have a huge audience, if you don't have time to answer your questions, uh, we will receive and then we will reply the questions um, for you from to the from the website. And then please note the chat box is the display during the session. Um, um, and then you also have the option to switch on the automatic subtitle at the bottom in your screen if you have difficult to hear the, the, the speakers. Um, nonetheless, if you have experience, uh, uh, you're experiencing technical problems, please send an email to for, for our system to the to the to the conference for our system. Um, well. Uh, welcome to to the sessions so to all of the speakers. Let's move to the first um, um, speaker. That is uh, Jin Zhang um, from the the key laboratory of water and sediment science of the Minister of Education. Um, and the School of Environment from Beijing University from China on the presentation about identification and occurrence of a fluorinated fipronil and fipronil degradate in municipal wastewater treatment plants. So welcome, thank you. Okay, thanks for the Casella. Um, hello everyone, my name is Qin Zhang and uh, Hmm. I'm pleased to attend the third IWR online conference. Uh, today, I will talk about the identification and the occurrence of the correlation products of FIPNU and its degradation in municipal wastewater treatment plants. Next, please. Next slide, please. A, a complex cocktail for the contaminating urban environments, a common contaminated sources, uh, pesticides for the tops, biocides for building protection, such as the, some of the fungicide leaching from the tile rubble, or such as the 6PPD and the, the 6PPDQ is really popular uh, emerging contaminants in, recent, in, in, in last years, and solvents or detergents. PPCPs, others, nanoplastics, and heaven metals. Next, please. Since the coronavirus disease, the application of disinfects was dramatically increased in public spaces. Uh, as one of the popular disinfect, chlorine based disinfectants are including the chlorine, chloramine, chlorine dioxide, and the sodium. Hypochlorite. As a result of the halogen disinfector byproducts, always show the high acute toxic toxic. So it's urgent to identify the those unknown unknown disinfected byproducts. Next, please. Uh, we selected uh, FIPNU was selected uh, as one of the import uh, uh, one of the type of compounds. A case study of FIPNU. FIPRIO are wi was widely used in agricultural applications and uh, run agricultural applications. With regard to the agricultural applications, it was used to control, control uh, in insect pests 
Uh, as a result of its high toxic to the aquatic organism, it was gradually prohibited from the 2004 to 2009 agricultural, agricultural applications. Um, therefore, it, it, its application was switched from the agricultural application to or land agriculture applications. It was widely used in urban pest management, veterinary and veterinary applications. The first picture shows the application of the FIPU in garden management. Next, please. A FIPU was likely to hydronesis, phytonesis, and the reduction, reduction and the oxidation to form four degree days. Uh, they are FIPU amine, FIPU sulfine. 50 so, so fine, 50 so far. We also collected the uh, information about the FIPRI and its degree days in aquatic environments. We have got the days from uh, 353 sample size. The, the worldwide distribution of FIPRI and its four principal degree days in aquatic environments was shown in this picture. In the uh, ocean anium and source, of, uh, source of American, we, we haven't seen. Uh, any reports about its degree days? Next, please. Um, uh, people and its degrees are widely detected in the urban environments. When they come into the wastewater treatment plants, various reaction chloride species reacted with people and its degree days. Uh, the hypothesis where they could have formation of the chloride is disinfect by product for the byproducts for the fibula and its degree days. Next, please. To, exp to explore this hypothesis, we have collected the wastewater sample from, from the 16 municipal wastewater treatments from three cities in China. And then 350 milliliters of wastewater influence or influence are uh, concentration in the HLB SP, SPE. Then finally, we, we analyze all the people in UPLC and the high resolution MS. Uh, a suspect screen strategy or combined with the high resolution, high re, high re resolution mass spectrum to identify those potential transformation products. The, the, the right table are a suspect list of the established on the basis of the correlation and the decorrelation um, processes. Next, please. The identification of the correlation products of people and its degrees in municipal wastewater treatments uh, from, finger, from the finger A to the D, we, um, we, we have get the, the four mass information, four mass for mass and MS2 information, we have found the two lower transformation products, fibrin chloramide and fibrin sulfide chloramide. Mm, but, mm, the, the monocle structure of those two lower transformation products are, products are shown in uh, finger A and finger B. Uh, next, please. The detection, frequency, and the concentration and the spatial distribution of fibrin in Many municipal wastewater treatments are shown in the Fig A and Fig B. In the influence, the detection frequency of the FIP was in range of 6.25% to 25%. And the medial concentration of FIP was 1.15 times higher than that of FIP sulfon and FIP sulfon chloride. In the influence, the detection and frequency was in range of the FIP was was in range of 6.25% to 87.5%. Fibrin sulfone was the most prevalent fibrin use in wastewater treat in the wastewater samples. Next, please. The difference of fibrin use in the municipal municipal wastewater influence and the influence from as shown in the finger finger A, the, the cumulative the concentration of fibrin use in the inward. Influence was significantly higher than the influence. Uh, the concentration of fibrinol in the influence was close to the tox toxic downs for some sensitive species. species. The formation of fibrinol sulfone and fibrinol sulfone chloride were introduced or induced by the sodium 
hypochlorite oxidation during wastewater treatment. As shown in the thing, thing B, uh, the two, two lower of the uh, defect byproducts are, are primary transformation products among those five trans among those five among those five transformation products. Next, please. The persistence and the bicomplication property of the fifth news was also predicted by the EPI suit. We have found the log KOW of the fifth new chloramine was 6.16.4. The half the water half life was one hundred eighteen, and the, the bio concentration facts was up to the eleven thousand two hundred. Uh, all of these are are shown. The fibrin chloride have a high persistence in the bio communications. Next, please. For the conclusions, the two lower chloride byproducts. Fibril chloramine, fibril sulfon chloramine were uh, identified and detected in the uh, wastewater treatment, treatment plants in China. Fibril chloramine and fibril sulfon chloramine were primary transformation products in both influence and influence. Both fibril chloramine and fibril sulfon chloramine were more persistent by bioaccumulative uh, than fibril chloramination products of fibril need to be included in future environmental monitoring and ecology risk assessment. Next slide. That's my presentation. Thanks for your, thanks for your attention. Thank you very much. Uh, nice presentation. And worth a trip from you also, and I know some of the challenge that we have for this, this research. <laughs> uh, thank you. Um, so uh, I would like to invite the next speaker then, um, that is Joseph Alkman, Director of Sunset Sustainability Research Program and Professor of Environmental System Science, School of Global Studies, Geographic Department of the University of Sussex in UK on the presentation about global hotspot areas of antibiotics loading to aquatic system. Thank you. Welcome, thank you. Thank you very much. Hello everyone. Uh, I'd like to present some preliminary results now on research at the University of Sussex on aquatic pathways of antimicrobial resistance. Next, please. Next. So why are we concerned about antimicrobial resistance? Well, the WHO calls it one of the top 10 health threats in the world right now. It has to do with the condition by which the overuse of antibiotics leads to frequent mutations of bacteria, leading to bacteria that are resistant to antibiotics or other medicines or other organisms being resistant to treatment. About a million deaths each year are already attributed to uh, conditions related to antimicrobial resistance, and it's making it much more difficult to treat important diseases like HIV and tuberculosis. And this research contributes to a new research area in looking at the environmental pathways of AMR. We know from field studies already that resistant bacteria and antibiotics are present in aquatic systems around the world. We also know that the more the antibiotics in river systems, the higher the frequency or the risk of um, antibiotic resistant bacteria in being produced. What we don't know is how important this pathway of exposure is to humans um, via water supply, water contact, fisheries, et cetera, as compared to other pathways. So our research aims to contribute to understanding the significance of aquatic pathways of AMR. Next, please. So we've contributed, are trying to contribute to this research by developing and applying a new model of total antibiotic loadings to aquatic systems and identifying the hotspot areas of loadings using this model. To do this, we've extended the water quality component of a standard global hydrologic model called water gap. This is a sketch of our new loading model, which I have no time to explain, unfortunately, but I will point out that we take into account 
both the flux of antibiotic residuals from both humans as well as livestock, take into account processes by which these antibiotic residuals are retained um, in the catchment and how much net runs off into rivers. Next, please. So here's some results already, some preliminary results, the global sums uh, based on grid cell calculations. The left bars show the amount of total antibiotic loadings to aquatic systems to catchments. Um, the total of these two bars, one component from human antibiotic loadings, the other from livestock loadings, adds up to around 120,000 tons per year. So that's our estimate of the total antibiotic loading to catchments around the world. Livestock loadings are a factor of five bigger than the human loadings. The two red bars to the right are much different than these, the loading to the catchments. These are the net loadings to rivers and lakes computed by the model by taking into account catchment processes that are retaining the antibiotic residuals. We estimate that about half of the human loads to catchments are retained in the catchments and about 96% of the livestock loadings are retained in soils in catchments. So the total to the river, if you add up these two red bars, is around 14,000 tons per year, about 10% of the catchment loading. Next, please. So here you see a map of our grid scale calculations, which underlie the global sums, which I just showed you. The red areas indicate the hotspot areas, which are arbitrarily defined as the loadings to rivers, which are greater than or equal to a 100 grams per square kilometer per year. Now you might say that's not much mass, but you have to take into account that antibiotic concentrations in aquatic systems at the nanogram per, nanogram per liter level are significant. Next, please. So the main hotspot areas occur where population density is high related to the human consumption of, of antibiotics, as well as the inadequate removal of this in sewers and in treatment plants. Most rural areas have much lower loading because of the retention of antibiotics in soil. Some rural areas, however, are hotspot areas, especially where the use of antibiotics in livestock is high, as in Europe, for example. So to sum up, the hotspot areas you can see from this map from our preliminary calculations are widely distributed around the world and on all continents. The next step in this research is to relate these loadings to river concentration so that we can assess the risk of spreading AMR via rivers and lakes. And I still have two seconds, done. Very interesting presentation. Um, let's move to the next one that is about the antibiotic also. Uh, I would like to invite uh, Masham Mash uh, Zampani from International Water Man Management Institute from Sri Lanka uh, on the presentation about uh, antibiotic resistance in aquatic ecosystem, priorities and knowledge, knowledge of the water quality modeling. Yeah. Thank you, Cassiana. Um, thanks everyone for being here. So my presentation is on antibiotic resistance in aquatic environments. And what is the priorities and knowledge at the current stage related to water quality modeling? And further to the Professor Alcamo just uh, mentioned actually, so the importance of the antibiotic resistance, how it is a huge emerging threat to the current world. In terms of the COVID pandemic, it is, it is a more severe threat than the COVID pandemic because it's a silent pandemic, they call it. Yeah, uh, next slide, please. So if you look at the global antibiotic consumption, the human use uh, is enormous in, uh, and some countries are not reporting, are not collecting enough data to report also. And if you look at the major countries which consuming metric, this is the data in metric terms, uh, China, US, Brazil, these countries are high consumption rates with respect to their populations. But if you compare the per capita or the daily doses, they are also very high in these countries and also some parts of the Middle East. Next slide, please. And during the COVID-19, the impact of antibiotics on the for consumption on the environment is, would have been enormous, but we don't know the reality of the situation, but there is a study saying that the, the amount of 
antibiotic consumption rapidly increased during the COVID. Suppose if you look at the proxy data sets, which we used uh, doxycycline and azithromycin, uh, which conveys actually during the peak of the COVID, the, the interest for the, these uh, antibiotics also rapidly increased. So which conveys further what is the impact of these antibiotics on the environment, which is unknown completely. Next slide, please. And if you look at the antibiotic resistance as antimicrobial resistance as emerging challenge, uh, two thirds of global antibiotic uh, production used in animal agriculture. And around 1.27 million deaths occurred in 2019 are attributed to the MR infections. And these infections are supposed to be increased by 10 million. This is a conservative estimate by 2050. And if we go the uh, global consumption of antibiotics increased by 65% from 2000 to 2015, which is projected to increase by 200% by 2030 as a business as usual scenario. So this, this has an enormous impact in terms of the economy because the World Bank did a study analyzing the uh, economic impact of AMR. So they found out that 1 trillion US dollars would be the uh, impact on the global economy by 2030. So over the last decade, antibiotic resistance or antimicrobial resistance primarily focused on measures to reduce the consumption of antibiotics, but there is uh, not much concentrate on the environment it seems. But in the, over the last decade, the, in, uh, the influence on the environment are the studies concentrating on the environment enormously increasing. So AMR finally go, keeps growing continuously. Next slide, please. So if you look at the sources, pathways and exposure, which are coming as antibiotics or antibiotic resistance, bacteria, antibiotic resistance genes into the environment. So there is principal sources are the aquaculture and the livestock and the human use, which is through the urban wastewaters either treated or untreated. If you look at the global south, majority or half of the percentage of the wastewaters are untreated. So it's uh, antibiotics or antibiotic resistance bacteria doesn't go through any treatment. So the more threat to the environment in our water systems. Uh, and also the pharma industries are the, are the uh, plays a key role in terms of the contributing to the environment and water systems. And the agriculture runoff, which is from the plant agriculture, the in terms of antibiotic use in the plant, uh, agriculture systems in terms of plant agriculture, which is quite minimum compared to the animal agriculture. But if you look at the odd sheets or apple crops to the streptomycin, which is uh, commonly used in several countries for these crops and these agriculture runoff coming into the water system, this is also quite unknown. What's the uh, contaminant pathways of this, of this use of this antibiotics? and further how the antimicrobial resistance will be impacting. So hospitals are other sources. So confluence of all these cocktail actually coming into the environment, how these interactions are happening. This is a very complex environment, which we need a thorough understanding. Next slide, please. And if you look at the uh, for water quality perspective from the livestock to the environment, and it's again, go back to the society, just because the people are dependent on the water systems for several uses. And the uh, livestock production is 63,000 tons into 2010, uh, which is predicted to increase by 67% by 2030 because of the increasing uh, meat consumption or milk consumption, other sources. So wastewater, polluted water, soil microbiomes, river sediments, which are the hotspots for the AMR development. And AMR pathogens, which are very common, are the Pseudomonas, are E. coli, mycobacterium, so which commonly already uh, presented in several studies these are the commonly available uh, AMR pathogens in the, in the water systems. So in terms of the water quality modeling, which is in very early stages, so we need a thorough understanding of the water quality modeling just because to tackle the complexity of AMR, water quality modeling can give you a perspective of understanding what's happening within the water, our water systems in terms of AMR spread. Next slide, please. So uh, we developed a framework, if you look at the, the sources and loadings and freight and transport on discussment, how from the sources and pathways, the systems transferring into the uh, freight and transport in terms of water quality modeling, there are existing models on the watershed hydrology on the microbial freight and transport. So combining these models, how we can address the selection pressure, gene transfer mechanisms, how the antimicrobial resistance bacteria and environmental bacteria interactions. And further, we have to do the management scenarios based on the water quality modeling to minimize the a risk of the antibiotic, anti antimicrobial resistance, just because uh, in the environment we cannot, or uh, we never see antibiotic and antibiotic uh, values to zero nanograms per liter. 
which is nearly impossible because the serious use of antibiotics by humans or the animals and in animal agriculture. Next slide, please. So further, if we take uh, two antibiotics at least, so like antibiotics one and two are the one bacteria. So the, the interactions between the complex interactions between these is very uh, high. If you look at the novel ARGs, which is like complex uh, combination of the different ARGs, how their interactions and how the endromically acquired resistance will be happening in terms of the anti uh, endromal bacteria transferring it to the uh, antibiotic resistance bacteria and also the multibiotic multi drug resistance. How the one or more drugs are influencing the bacteria and it becomes the antibiotic resistance to the these two or three drugs or more drugs. So further, it has this uh, compound impact on human health and several other infection and incident rates and uh, several other processes which we can discuss. Uh, next slide, please. So in terms of the modal complexity, if we look at this one, actually, it explains the endromatal bacteria, which is interacting with the resistance genes or antibiotic residues or other heavy metals or uh, other pollutants. So then uh, if you convert, if you, the pathogen of environmental nature convert into the resistance and antibiotic resistance nature, so the resistance development will have a different impact compared to the environmental bacteria. So then it becomes either resistant to one drug, two drugs, three, uh, three drugs or more drugs. So when these water interacts with the humans, we don't know what happens actually, because it's, uh, the studies are still going on, uh, which is in very early stages. And also at the same time, the water systems itself has this uh, phenomena of the different hydrological process or climatic process, which uh, an antibiotic residues or antibiotic resistance genes coming into the environment, then the river sediments will have the settling and resuspension process, which they store the antibiotic resistance genes for some time until unless there is a Resuspension going on, and also nutrient availability, interconnectedness of the water systems, either river to groundwater interactions or river lake interactions. So these are all complex interactions which define the antimicrobial resistance, uh, fate and transport in the water systems. And also, not only this, when we go to the biofilm soil columns, there are several others impacts also external factors influ influenced. Next slide, please. So. In overall, antibiotic antimicrobial resistance is an emerging threat and which is damaging the ecosystems and human health. Uh, environment and climate in general plays a crucial role. Uh, wastewater, soils, polluted waters, river sediments, these are the key for the AMR development and spread. And water quality molding in general would understand, help us understand the complex process of this AMR nature. And we need effective solutions in terms of AMR stewardship, treatment technologies, effective management solutions. Uh, pollution mitigating strategies. Some of these are existing, but in terms of the AMR, these, these are also need an extension because water quality modeling can also not help you play a critical role in understanding the process or also developing scenarios and management solutions, which is very critical for uh, understanding or uh, dealing with the AMR threat. Thank you very much. Next slide, please. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you. Excellent presentation. Um, I would like now to invite Adelaide Mamoud Sonko from Institute of Environmental Science of Sheikh and Deepo University of Dakar in Senegal on the presentation about uh, marine pollution linked to wastewater discharge at the Sombe. Som the dome, I do not know how to relate yeah. it, it is. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah. Prospecting the implementation of marine swimming water standard in Senegal. <laughs> Thank you to bring your Hi. work. Uh, hello, everybody. Uh, my name is Elach Mamoru Sonko. I'm going to present you my work about the marine pollution linked to wastewater discharge at Sumbi Junwarf prospect for the implementation of marine swimming water standard in Senegal. Next, please. Next slide. Okay, I can see you in this uh, uh, slide that in Senegal, we have some problem with uh, wastewater management. 
uh, very uh, huge part of water that are not treating and are discharged in this uh, in the wet water in the sea without treating and this can cause very many hazard of uh, about the people who are using this uh, area so we can say in this study we want to in general, to evaluate the marine pollution related to the liquid effluent discharge from the stormwater drainage uh, pipes. And we have one hypothesis that this hypothesis want to verify if the water from this canal pollute the marine water about the, around the wharf and can uh, lead to dangerous hazard for swimming peoples. And we want to address this three case question, the origin of the pollution, the quality of the wastewater, and the third is the impact of this stormwater drainage into the marine water. Next, please. Uh, in this slide, we present the sampling point. So you can see in this map that we samples in five points from the outlet to 5,500 from the edge. Next, please. Uh, we also monitor this uh, uh, pollutants, uh, salinity, pH, and also uh, TS, TSS, COD, and BOD. And the uh, coliform OC are monitored according to the French standard or ISO 85 and 32. Next. As a result, we can see, uh, I color it in red, that the water from this canal uh, from originated from a uh, household that can impact the quality of the water. Next, please. And we can see in this uh, two picture that also the water is discharged via clandestine connection and opportunity discharge. And this can uh, lead to permanent presence of water in the, the canal. Next. Also here we can see, we compare with European standard and we can see that the swimming is only possible from uh, 500 from the edge as PPPP3. And we got this uh, lead to the presence of fecal contamination often is correlated with pathogenic organism. That's why the swimming is not is only possible from uh, 500 because in this point we have a concentration of fecal coliform lower than European standards. Next. Also, we can see in this uh, water system, this drainage system, that there are a lot of uh, solid waste. And this solid waste can lead to uh, aesthetic, uh, contam aesthetic pollution. And this aesthetic pollution can have uh, very many hazards with uh, the, the fishermen and also the, the fish in this area. Next. Okay, we can say as a, a conclusion, uh, because our objective is to have some uh, standards, we can say that we can use these three uh, elements to build a standard for swimming water. The first one is fecal coliform, uh, which can correlate with health risk, the micro pollutants, and heavy metals as in this water, everything is discharged from batteries and also uh, uh, many type of uh, solid waste. Thank you for uh, sharing. Thank you, Elad, for your presentation. It's nice to see that uh, we, are, have, we have to face it. many others, old, uh, problems together with the emergent contaminants, uh, problems, right? Uh, this is the reality here for us also. Thank you very much. Um, 
I would like to invite now Mary Chinway from Institute of Water Research from Hodge University in South Africa. And the presentation about antibiotic resistance in com uh, complement vector in the, as an emergent pollutant in salt rivers ester cap in South Africa. Thank you, Mary. Thank you very much. Greetings, everybody, and thank you to the previous presenters. Like I've already been introduced, I'm presenting on antibiotic resistant Campylobacter as an imaging pollutant in the Swatkops River in the Eastern Cape. Next slide, please. Our Campylobacter species are among the leading etiological agents for a gastroenteritis in many parts of the world. Uh, the current global problem that we're experiencing right now is that these pathogens are becoming resistant to clinically relevant uh, antibiotics such as the fluoroquinolones, tetracyclines, and microlytes. Campylobacter infections uh, have mainly been attributed to the consumption of uh, contaminated food, but the studies have shown that uh, this uh, uh, pathogen can also be transmitted through water. Next slide, please. There is evidence that rivers are playing an important role in the transmission of antibiotic resistant uh, uh, species such as Campylobacter. And the presence of these uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria in rivers are mainly attributed to human waste and animal and also from livestock. The Swatkops rivers, uh, River, which uh, uh, is the area of study, flows through urban areas in the Nelson Mandela municipality and it is impacted by a number of anthropogenic activities. Now Campylobacter species are one of the uh, problems that we have identified in these uh, river systems. Next slide. This study investigated the local prevalence of antibiotic resistant Campylobacter in source waters and the factors that are leading to its presence in the Swatkops River. Next slide. The methods that were employed in this study included a comprehensive review of uh, scientific databases to investigate the prevalence of antibiotic resistant Campylobacter species uh, in South Africa, among the rivers here in South Africa. Then uh, the study also collected information on the drivers of, uh, of Campylobacter pollution in uh, river system. This was conducted through a questionnaire survey among us, the residents of the Nelson Mandela Bay municipality and also a participatory workshop which involves uh, people from the community. And then lastly, uh, an explorative study was conducted to assess uh, Campylobacter species and Campylobacter antibiotic resistant genes uh, in the uh, Swatkops River. So this was done using um, a molecular techniques. Uh, molecular biology was used to do this. Next slide, please. So the results from the uh, the, the, the literature show that there's the, pre the prevalence of antibiotic resistant Campylobacter in uh, water or in rivers in South Africa is high. So several studies have uh, reported uh, ant detected antibiotic resistant genes. They've also detected different uh, types of uh, resistance, resistance to different types of antibiotics as can be seen in these uh, illustrations. Next slide, please. And then among the factors that are leading to the occurrence of antibiotic resistant Campylobacter in the waters, they are coming from uh, basically from the catchment from the community. And these were categorized into societal, uh, society, technology, environment, economy, politics, and historical. So for society, we have issues of poor water, water and sanitation, overcrowding, poor solid waste management practices, uh, overuse and inappropriate use of, uh, of antibiotics in the community. For technology, we have treatment failure in terms of wastewater treatment uh, plants, which are not uh, functioning. And then um, we also have uh, environmental issues, which are leading to pollution of water in these catchments. Then um, for economy, we have poverty and then the poor investment in uh, water and sanitation infrastructure. Most of the times it's not really a priority. Then on governance is a poor delivery in terms of water and sanitation services and failure by local municipalities. So all these things are leading to pollution of water uh, with uh, resistant organisms such as Campylobacter. 
Then on the historical part, we have uh, the historical uh, spatial planning, which was done in the upper side uh, time where planning was uh, residential areas were designed according to races and also service delivery was also based on the races. So what this means is that uh, there are certain people who are living in particularly the townships which are black dominated where there's poor service delivery and there's also a lot of uh, uh, indiscriminate disposal of wastewater and uh, exposure to fecal matter from animals and also humans. So all these things are leading to increase in antibiotic resistance uh, because um, of uh, high usage in terms of uh, antibiotic uh, are disposed mainly in the environment and then this is leading to resistance. Next slide, please. Then for the uh, detection, the laboratory work which was conducted, uh, Campylobacter was detected uh, in uh, water samples, uh, that is in 58.33% of the water samples that were sampled along the Swartkops rivers, the river, and then also tetracycline resistant genes were also detected uh, in 76% of the Campylobacter positive samples. Then among us, the Campylobacter positive samples, Campylobacter multi-drug resistant genes were detected uh, so these were detected uh, at 20%, uh, 65%, uh, and um, also, uh, detect, also detected in these uh, water samples. Uh, so, and also 10%. Uh, we can move to the next slide. So in conclusion, what this means is that uh, the presence of uh, antibiotic resistant Campylobacter in source water, such as the Swartkops River, is a serious public health threat. The issues are that uh, most of the studies have uh, local studies and even in the region, they've concentrated, concentrated on the clinical aspects of antimicrobial resistance and even antibiotic resistance. But uh, um, it is important to pay attention to improving water and sanitation at community level in order to reduce the burden of uh, waterborne uh, uh, inf infections and hence reducing the need of uh, antibiotics. And then also there is need for more awareness on the environmental effects of uh, ant antibiotic resistance in the community. Most people are not aware on the effects of uh, poor disposal or antibiotic uh, uh, um, uh, abuse in the community. Then compliance and enforcement in terms of antibiotic use in uh, humans and animals also needs to be improved. And also monitoring and surveillance of antibiotic resistance uh, uh, antibiotic resistant bacteria and antibiotic resistant genes in water needs to be uh, emphasized. At policy level, antibiotic resistant bacteria and genes concentration should also be included in water quality guidelines and standards. Uh, most of the times we just concentrate on looking at uh, indicator organisms, the fecal coliforms and all that, and we do not look into these things. Then we also need to invest in uh, innovations for um, uh, innovations for and technologies for the removal of uh, removal and reduction of antibiotic resistant bacteria in effluent uh, because uh, wastewater has proved to be one of the major contributors uh, to uh, antibiotic resistance uh, uh, in uh, river systems. Uh, policy, uh, policy measures also for curtailing the spread of uh, antibiotic resistance uh, from uh, environmental hotspots also need to be emphasized. So thank you very much, we can move to the next slide. I would like to thank uh, my supervisor and my sponsors for uh, sponsoring me. And uh, thank you very much for this opportunity also to present at this uh, conference. We can move to the last slide. We can move, yeah, thank you very much. So this is just a picture showing animals. Thank, thank you. you very much, it's our pleasure. Very interesting presentation. Um, now I would like to invite Peno Jersey from European Regional Center of Hydrologic and Polish Academy of Science at UNESCO from Poland on the presentation about the special temporal monitoring of the sites in streams for the development of eco-hydrological natural based solution. Thank you for coming. Thank you, thank you. So hello, ladies and gentlemen. My name is Paweł Jarosiewicz. Uh, I am very glad for being here and for you to listen to my presentation about pesticides and eco-hydrological nature-based solutions. So please, the next slide. 
So I really enjoy starting my presentations from the concept of planetary boundaries, which was proposed by Johan Rockström and colleagues uh, some time ago. But until the last year, the area of novel enterprise, and here we can find uh, emerging contaminants or pesticides, was not quantified. And uh, authors, person at all, they showed that also in this area, we already crossed the planetary boundary. So heading towards uh, unknown area with unknown consequences. And uh, among the pesticides, so the important message is that pesticides are toxic. All of them are toxic. This is their model of action. Uh, and still we apply 4 million tons pesticides per year and the consumption is growing because of the food production and food consumption. So next slide, please. And my research area is focused, is located in central Poland. You can see this small uh, pink square uh, where we have in Poland a lot of uh, apple orchards. And believe me or not, apple is the biggest, one of the biggest consumers of pesticides in terms of food production. So we selected four different catchments with different land use, different uh, hydrological parameters. So of course, several hypotheses were uh, applied here, but today I will focus only on quantity, quantitative results about the pesticides. So please, the next slide. Uh, and to show you what we found in those four catchments. But to give you the background, it is important to understand how we monitor pesticides in Poland. Uh, this is according to the Water Framework Directive of the European Commission, where we have the list of priority substances, including 24 pesticides. And from 2020, uh, none of them, none of those pesticides uh, is still in use in, in European Union. This is because those were a very toxic compounds so they were banned. And this is very good, of course, but uh, how our monitoring system is working, I am not very happy with it because we are monitoring the substances that are not applied on the field. And our agriculture or horticulture orchards, they still use a lot of pesticides. There are over 2000 products registered in Poland only applied on the fields. So this is one of the message how we need to change our monitoring approaches. Uh, and then what we found in our study in these four catchments, uh, these are 30 different pesticides. We only measured 90, 95 due to our methodology. So here on the right, you have the list of those pesticides. I marked uh, some of them, two of them with the maximum concentrations found to give you some toxicity importance. And if you consider the EC50 value for Daphnia magna, which is one of the most important organisms of aquatic bodies, you can see that this cocktail can be very, um, uh, can be very dangerous. Next slide, please. So what can we do in this situation? One of the solutions is to apply more nature-based solutions in water resources management. About this concept and how we develop it with my team, you can read in the paper that recently was published in Ecohydrology Hydrobiology Journal. Here is the title. And also my second field of study is to increase the sorption capacity of those systems that is presenting, one of them is presented here on the picture, uh, to catch, trap the pollutants, including the pesticides. So next slide, please. We developed the new material named BioCare that when modified with biochar or activated carbon can trap very easily the pesticides. So we tested it with MCPA and this was the pesticide that was most common uh, in our four catchments. And we found out that the efficiency is very high over 90%. So we propose to implement more nature-based solutions that can trap the specific pollutants, the river basin specific pollutants to increase the efficiency of the system. And this is how we can apply such uh, permeable reactive barriers with different sorption materials, of course, supported by vegetation, bacteria, and other ecohydrological processes. So next slide, please. And here are my key results and message to take home. So existing threat is not addressed by the monitoring programs, at least in Europe, but in global perspective, the situation is the same or even worse. And what can we do? So we need more nature-based solutions in water management. So let the nature do the job and we need better monitoring and better policy. So let the people do the job. These are two key messages. And uh, I welcome you to visit the UNESCO Ecohydrology demo site platform, where we present a lot of ideas from all over the world about similar topics. And please contact me if you have any questions. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. An interesting presentation also. Um, 
So finally, I would like to invite um, Win Jin Du from the Department of Environment and Ecological Engineer from Guangdu University of Education from China on the presentation of transgeneration toxicity effect of on CL and DPCL on the water flea on moin macro. Welcome. Okay, thank you. Um, good morning, everyone. I'm Yun Qi Du, an undergraduate senior from the Guangdong University of Education, China. I'd like to thank the organizing committee first for allowing me to present our study here. Today, I will present our study, Transgenerational Toxic Effects of Omicron and DPY Cori on the Water Free Mona Macricoper. Next, please. Volatile solvents such as acetone, methanol, and so on are liquid that vaporize at room temperature. They are widely used in industrial processes, but these solvents have many physical health and environmental hazards. They are highly toxic, they are flammable, and they have a quite high vapor pressure. Therefore, some greener chemicals are developed to minimize the impact of volatile organic solvents, such as supercritical fluid, gas expanded liquid and liquid polymer. And ionic liquids are considered a kind of green solvent. Ionic liquids are also known as room temperature molten salt. The left red in the picture is common salt and the right is an ionic liquid. Next one. Ionic liquid consists of a larger organic cation and an organic or inorganic anion. They have plenty of advantages compared to volatile solvents. They have a negligible vapor pressure, high boiling point, low combustibility, and excellent electric conductivity. So importantly, the structures and properties can be easily designed. Next, please. But with the increasing use of this new solvent, the ecological impact has been considered a big issue. For example, they are harder to recycle than volatile solvents. Because of their high water solubility, they easily enter the waters. They are also found to be difficult to degrade in the environment. So increasing number of studies have reported the toxic effects of ionic liquid. Next, please. However, the knowledge of how ionic liquid affects crustacean is limited, especially whether the effects can be transferred across generations is still unclear. Next, please. So we aim to demonstrate the transgenerational effects of two kinds of ionic liquid. One is an imidazolium-based ionic liquid, omicoride, and another is a pyridinium-based ionic liquid, DPY chloride. Next, please. And we compare their effect using the water-free minor microcoper. This animal is widespread around the world and widely used in toxicity tests. Next one. Our experiment start with an actual experiment to obtain LC50 of these two ionic liquids. Um, in the AQ toxicity experiment, we randomly selected 10 newborn uh, minor from the same mother in one treatment and set eight concentration from 0 to 3.2 milligram per liter. And the LC15 value was then used to design the chronic and transgenerational toxicity experiment. In the chronic experiment, we recorded the, the effects on minor survival shape, development, and reproduction. And we set the concentration at 1 400 to 1 tenth of the 24 hours LC50. Um, in the transgenerational test, we explore maternal generation to the poison and the first brought from maternal generation and first generation were culture under non-toxic conditions. 
and the same procedure as those used in chronic tests were applied in tra transgenerational experiments. Next, please. As the results show, 14 A hours LC50 of two ionic liquids are 0.167 and 0.47 milli milligram per liter, respectively. They all less than one milligram per liter. According to the hazard rating, these two chemicals are high toxicity to miners. Next one. The effect on survival shape is shown in this figure. The first line concerns the results of three generations of Omicron. Right? It can be seen that the survival shape of the maternal generation decreased with increasing concentration and the trend in the first generation is similar to that of maternal generation. But in the second generation, all groups are not significantly different from the control group. The second line is about the results of DPY chloride. We can see that with the continuation of generations, the toxicity of DPY chloride increased. Next one, please. For effect on development, we checked the body length for Omicron. Looking at the data at the concentration of 1 tenth LC15 from maternal generation to first generation, the reduction rate of body length increased from 34.5% to 27.1%, and in second generation, it returned to the normal level. However, the situation is getting worse for Omicron, right? which decreased from 36.8% in maternal generation to 15.8% in second generation. Next one, please. For effects on reproduction, at 1.15 LC50, the cumulative reproductive numbers of maternal generation and first generation exposed to Omicron right, decreased to 16.1% and 8.6% of the number of the black group. But reproduction recovered in all second generation groups. However, for DPY call right, the reproduction is getting less. For example, the number at 1.100 LC15 groups are 16.3% in maternal generation and 14.5% in first generation and 3.1% in second generation. So compared to Omicron, right, DPY call right has a more adverse effect on the miners. Next one, please. To conclude, Omicron right and DPY call right is defeating high toxicity to minor. Chronic explorer shorten its life expectancy, repress its body development, and reduce its fecundity. And the effects of only call right recovered in three generations, but effects induced by DPY call right continue. So the risk raised by ionic liquid to the aquatic environment is the worth of attention. Next, please. Um, my presentation ends here. Thank you for your listening. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, interesting presentation also. We had a nice session. So we have the uh, time for questions. So uh, I would like to invite Colin Clem, my deco moderator of the session to select some of the questions for us to discuss here in this time. Thank you, Carl. Okay, thank you. And, for, and thank you to all the presenters for sticking to time. We have about 10 minutes now for, for questions. I've seen that some questions have come in and have already been answered in, in writing by the presenters, which is great. There, there is one, I think it's a general question, um, which has come in from Santiago Obispo. I, I'm sorry if I've mispronounced your name who says, greetings, we are from uh, traditional local communities in the Orinoco River, Amazonas, Venezuela, 
And the question is, how can we join this ongoing process or project from the perspective of our traditional knowledge? Um, I'm wondering if any of the panelists have uh, some thoughts on that or some advice for indigenous and traditional communities, how to deal with these contaminants of emerging concern in, in their waterways. Oh, Pablo? maybe I can uh, try. Uh, to give some uh, recommendations. So I believe one of the co-organizers of this conference, the UNESCO, the mission of UNESCO is to use this very important indigenous people knowledge for water resources management. And this is what, what we can observe in the global scale. So what I could recommend is to contact uh, some UNESCO headquarters for the Latin America and maybe try to reach uh, some projects that are ongoing, or maybe you can propose also you know, your own, own projects. Uh, and there are a lot of um, ongoing actions under the UNESCO that you can join, particularly in the Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, some conferences like this one to make contacts. Uh, this is what could be done at this point, I believe. Thank you. Does anyone else have any uh, comments or advice? Joseph, yeah. I mean, this is an overall issue that I think is really important for the science community, but especially if, because I think uh, the appreciation of the value of indigenous knowledge is coming from the social sciences, whereas those of us that are working in uh, analyzing aquatic systems tend to come from the natural scientists. And I don't think the word has really penetrated our community. Um, so what I would propose also is that then maybe per perhaps UNESCO or IWRA can take leadership by organizing maybe some structured discussions between indigenous people, natural scientists, and social scientists. At this point, it's a pivotal point, um, which uh, perhaps a little leadership can uh, make us uh, get some progress on it. Thank you. And, and I guess that, that um, if I could also add, this is a broader issue for communities in general, um, who we're dealing with quite complicated science and issues. And I think, uh, how do we improve the understanding of the general public and empower them also to either take action or to, to prevent uh, unnecessary uh, uh, disposal of, of these chemicals or to protect themselves from exposure to them themselves? How do we, how do we get that message across to a common, uh, in a common language? Does anyone have any thoughts on that? I believe Sarantuya is raising her hand. Sarantuya, please feel free to jump in. <laughs> One of our ISC uh, co-chairs, Sarantuya Zarandaya from UNESCO. Yeah, uh, not uh, thank you, uh, Callum. Thank you, Powell and Joseph, um, for referring to UNESCO's role in traditional knowledge. So my feedback comment is on traditional knowledge, not on your last comment. So of course, uh, local indigenous and traditional knowledge are an important source of knowledge from which we can learn and we can also find um, solutions, mainly based nature-based solutions. So UNESCO has a program called LINKS, Local Indigenous and Traditional Knowledge, and how to apply this knowledge in managing sustainably environment and water resources. So, of course, we will be happy to um, uh, ask our colleagues in LINCS program to focus on water issues. And actually, we jointly contributed to the thematic panel of the second high level Dushanbe conference on the role of indigenous knowledge. So we really um, take this comment and we will consider it in our activities. Thank you. Thank you, Sarantia. I have uh, also a couple of questions now for um, Al Haji. Um, one is from Josephine, who uh, has, says, has asked, How can Africa deal with the disposal of waste? Sort of indiscriminate disposal of waste seems to cut across many parts of the continent. Do you have any response to that? Uh, yes. Hello. Uh, thanks, Josephine, for your question. Uh, what I want to say is. Uh, uh, about this this question, I can answer that if you want to deal with uh, waste 
management in Africa, the first step is to make waste management a priority by putting all facilities, necess necess the necessary facilities for transport, collect and uh, treatment and also disposal of the waste. The second uh, point is to educate the population, educate the population about what's storing. This is a lack in Africa. And the uh, third is to provide specific uh, trainings of uh, human resources. Because in Africa, we have uh, people that are working in uh, waste management, but they have not all the capacities to manage this, uh, these works. And the fourth one for me is to improve the regulation and to enforce them because we have some regulation, but not enforce it yet. This is uh, my answers about this question. Thank you. And, and there's a second question I see that's just come in for you as well, which I think they're asking, um, how were the solutions for better coastal edges for healthy swimming implemented? Yeah, we have a regulation, but not specific for the, uh, the swimming water. Uh, that's the, the lack of our regulation, but we can uh, enforce the regulation of uh, water management and also environmental. We have some regulation, but these regulations are not specific to the, the swimming water. That's why we want to, to build, to propose some uh, pollutant we can use to build a standard and also to make the policies to monitor the quality of the seawater. That the, the objective, the main objective of this study. Right. And could I ask, where would you be looking for those examples, sort of regulatory or policy examples? Are you yes, building we, from scratch or are you looking at other? No, we are, we are looking from the EU, European Union have some standards. Morocco also have uh, some standards. And also we have some standards from uh, uh, WHO. So we want to make a mix from this. And also to, we don't want to pass just these standards because we want also to, to correlate these standards with the uh, economic development of Senegal. Because if you make hard standards, you maybe the companies or the authority don't have the means to fit these standards. That's why we, may, we want to make a specific standard for Senegal. That, that sounds very sensible. I, I'm curious to see how this evolves and I hope, I wish you well in this, in this project. Okay. Um, we had uh, just one comment that's come in, uh, communi uh, it's a, from an anonymous attendee, I don't know who sent it, but communicating with indigenous people may work well if they are contacted by their own local leaders who are educated and trained in these issues in their own language and these people become educators of their own knowledge. Uh, that is a mix of hard science, but also blends of their traditional knowledge of water and water treatment techniques. So, uh, so that's a, a comment that's coming from the audience. I think we're, we're almost out of time for questions. Um, there, there was another one, very last one. The European Union has a rollout of five missions with clean water in the focus. Um, do you know who is joining the Horizon EU program? It's a very general question. I don't know if anyone has any comment on that. No. Okay. Well, I think we're done with the questions, Cassiana. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, thank you all the speakers for this uh, wonderful section. Uh, uh, we also want to remind you that uh, we can see excellent selection of submitted conference posters on our website. And uh, we can find this poster in this poster menu. I hope everyone had some time to go there and visit. 
Um, and if you have a, any questions of the posters, um, you can send them to the conference um, email and they contact the authors and then respond to your questions. And uh, with regard of the PowerPoint presentations, we also had some questions about that. We just, uh, uh, that we have just to uh, see, uh, they will be made available soon in our website, along with the video recording of this session. Uh, also, the policy orientation message will be published in the uh, policy brief, briefs uh, of the conference. And the high-quality high selection contributions uh, will be considering for publication in the UNESCO screen book. So the authors will be, uh, we, we, they, they will contact the authors uh, soon to talk about that. Um, well, once again, I would like to thank you, Colin, to help me to moderate this session. And all of these speakers, the speakers to, to, to bring your research to us and to provide this wonderful discussion about that. Thank you very much. And you see, I'll see you again in the next session. Bye-bye.